I would use as a subject today, wasted grace. Wasted grace. Would you bow your heads with me, Father in heaven? This moment is yours. These people are yours. I'm only a wretched lump of sinful clay. Do with this moment, do in this pulpit, do in this place. According to your divine design is our prayer in Jesus' name. And let God's children say, Amen. Amen. Last Sabbath, in our introductory launching pad. I told you then that I would come back to that which we laid as our foundation that Paul said the world desire wisdom. Some desire a sign. Show me a sign and I will believe. Tickle my intelligence and I will contemplate it. Greek intelligentsia said, I can't believe in the cross. A God who suffers can't be God. Greek intelligentsia said, Ah, he has got to be above the stuff that harasses mere humanity. The Greek said, It is foolishness to believe in the story of the cross. For the Jews it was a scandal on a stumbling block. It was a superabundant mountain they couldn't get around because uh, somewhere in their liturgy they knew the, the text that says cursed be he who hung on a cross. What they did not know was that he who is ultimate righteousness became a curse for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And as he went through Corinth on separate missionary journeys, looking at sin in all its ignominy and in all its ugly, gory details, Paul said, I desire to know nothing else among you. I come preaching the cross. Told you then that the cross is preachable. It was then, it is now. Then, in the first century of the Christian gospel, a handful at best, if you take the number from the Mount of Olives, they'll tell you it's 500. Paul said that right into the church in Colossae. Paul lived during the heyday of Roman power. The smallest estimate given by Josephus is that the Roman kingdom then, stretching almost enveloping the then known world, he in his minor estimate, 180 odd million, 500 Christians. And yet, in less than 40 years, there were 1 million Christians spreading throughout Rome. The governor of Plenty said, You Christians are everywhere. You're in our Senate, you're in our government, you're in every facet of society. You are like maggots everywhere. And in his disgust of the Christian church, he teamed up with Roman power. But I stopped by your pulpit just to make an announcement. Tell the devil, insult can kill the Christian gospel. Tell the devil, he can beat the church in surrender. Tell the devil the blood of the martyrs is but the seed of the gospel. 
and down through millenniums of history, God has always found persons who are willing to stand up and be counted. And today we conclude the seventh of the seven statements. Told you last Sabbath that from the vantage point of Christ, we have a purpose to live for. We have principles to live out. We have people to live with. We have a power to depend on. We have promises to rely on. And so in the beginning of his ministry, Jesus began that final week by committing and surrendering his life to his father in preparing for Calvary. You see, you've got to prepare for battle before you get into battle. Amen. Just as how we have to prepare for church before you get into church. Can I really be myself today? Ah, uh, you ought to know that the devil comes to church. And so, in order not for the devil to get on your wrong side, before you leave home, you've got to put on the whole armor of God. If you leave home without it, somebody on the highway may take the little godly... Can I really be myself? Yes. Got to leave home on the right side. Yes. And so, in preparation for the final week, did he not say... For this cause came I in the world. Did he not say I come to do your will, O God? Your law is in my heart. Did he not say I am come to give my life a ransom for many? And so in Gethsemane, humanity and divinity robed together in that struggle. And in the quietness of the evening weather, in the quietness of the garden perfumed by heavenly atmosphere, Luke captured something that Matthew, Mark, and John didn't pick up. Luke said he prayed until his sweat became great drops of blood falling down to the ground under intense pressure. His blood vessels erupted, mingling sweat and blood together. It is in that context that he prayed, Father, I still have the capacity to see the future, but in my humanness, there's something troubling. Let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. If I have my way, I wouldn't be a Christian. If I have my way, I wouldn't be an Adventist Christian. If I have my way, I wouldn't keep a seventh day Sabbath. If I had my way, I would still be eating and drinking as I like. But as a child of God, I can't have my way. Because his ways are higher than mine. His thoughts are higher than mine. And I've got to pray like Jesus. Nevertheless, when my humanity wants something else. Nevertheless, because I know your will, I've got to surrender. We don't have the intelligence nor the wisdom to manage our lives independently of God. No matter how intellectually a giant you think you are, you are going to make stupid mistakes. We can't amass enough wealth to help us live a life free from trouble. Because no matter how much money you have, you will discover that the air you breathe is infected. The water you drink isn't as pure as they said it is. The food you eat isn't as safe as you think it is. And sooner rather than later, if you live long enough, you'll get to the place where you have money and you have no health. 
You have the money and it can't buy back your health. You have excellent doctors. You have fantastic nurses. You have fabulous medication. But when you get down to that critical issue, yes. all the doctors and all your intelligence and all your wealth and all the friends that you've had in high places, you come now to understand you've got to suffer alone and you must die alone. And in this life, we seek for security. And that's why before you die, you have to discover there is a purpose for which to live. If you do not make that discovery, in spite of your intelligence, you'll be the poorest and the most foolish the world has ever seen. If you don't make the discovery to understand that there is more to life than money and fame and wealth and pleasure and sex and drugs and dancing and singing, there's more to life than food. There's more to this life than earthly human fellowship. You've got to make that discovery that you and I have a divine purpose for which to live. God gave you life without your asking for it. And life will be taken from you whether you want to let it go, yes or no. He woke you up this morning. I heard someone said, no, it was my alarm clock. Well, I, I drive through your city going to different places. I don't know where it was going, but, but for almost what seemed to be miles and miles, all I saw on both sides were ugly gravestones, tall tombstones. If you think it was your alarm clock that woke you up, turn it on the highest decibel and take it down to the cemetery and see whom it will wake up. God woke you up this morning. God kept you all your life. God is keeping you even when we ignore him. God is keeping us. We have his purpose to live for. But Jesus said, I I come in the volume of the book. I came to live out God's principles. I came to succeed where the first Adam failed. I came to show humanity that there is enough power in God to help you live out the principles of God. Adam failed. So did Abraham. So did Methuselah and David and Samson and Levi, Simeon, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, God, Benjamin, Asher, Joseph. So did the 12 chosen sons. So did the 12 disciples. 12 is God's kingdom number. In the Old Testament, he chose 12 and they failed him. In the New Testament, he chose 12 and they failed him. But God's purpose will be fulfilled. The devil will not have the last word. In the Garden of Eden, he wrenched the keys from the hand of Adam. He dubbed himself the prince of this world. He claimed our allegiance. And that's why, like a child who you don't have to teach to dance, play the music and the black babies starts to move. We, we, we bend to sin. The rhythm of sin is in our DNA. And that's why we must be born again. So Jesus said, I came to show you God's purpose for which to live. I came to live out God's principles because humanity is failing. But God so loved humanity, so loved the world. He gave his only son because there will not be one empty seat in glory. One third of the angels took side with the devil against God. And I, no, this is Samuel's Theology, I believe. Now, 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 it must have been a huge number. For when John was counting the angels, he said, I saw 
10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of them. The judgment was set. I saw them surrounding the throne. Now, 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 now listen to me. One third of 10,000 times 10,000 of holy angels, one third of that innumerable company of angels, one third took side with the devil and lost their seat in glory. There are some empty seats up yonder. And here, here's Samuel's virgin. He didn't go to Mars, Pluto, Saturn, or Jupiter. He came down to this tiny planet, this tiny speck peopled with sin, this tiny speck infected with iniquity. It is in this tiny mess that God invested himself. He came with the remedy for sin. He came to detoxify this planet he came down to my level cause I couldn't get up to his and with a strong arm he lifted me up he showed me there's a purpose for which to live he shows me there's power to live out his principles and so he's moving through islands and continents with the everlasting gospel. There'll be no confusion in my father's kingdom. From one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before God. You won't find some going to work and some going to church on the Sabbath. We'll be wired up to the same divine computer. He's selecting from this planet to fill every vacant seat in glory. He's selecting from this planet, from a rebellious, recalcitrant, stubborn, stiff-necked, and sinful race. He's selecting from this planet to fill every empty seat. And so... Paul, I'm coming back to our text. I know you want me to hurry up and get there. I'm doing the best I can. I'm hurrying up, taking my time. Or I'm taking my time to hurry up. And so I want to take you to a critical text. And then I get to our critical text. Since I didn't plan to say it, but, but God has veto powers over my life. Amen. And, and, and he planted this text. I walked out here with something else. But when I got up, he planted this text. Amen. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. We then... And you have to understand when he said, we then, he's including himself. Well, well, what did he say about himself? He said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So the chief of sinners is saying, we then, the hired assassin, the one-time murderer, now says, we then, we then as workers together with him, beseech you also that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. We then, we who were once a bunch of nobodies, he picked us up, cleaned us up, turned us around, planting our feet on higher ground. We then, like the murderers, we then, like Mary the prostitute, we then, like Rahab the harlot, we then, like Samson the womanizer, we then, we then, as workers together with you, we have been the recipient of amazing grace. And because of what grace has done to us, because of what grace is doing in us, we then 
beg you in the name of Jesus, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Whatever sin you have, grace has the remedy. Whatever weakness you're struggling with, grace has the remedy. We then beg you, we who have felt the power of grace, we who know that we are sin abound, grace, death, much more abound. We who know that the glitter of sin won't last, we beg you in the name of Jesus Christ, do not receive the grace of God in vain. To turn up at the judgment bar of God, to hear the words, depart from me, I know you not. And from that verdict, there shall be no appeal. Heaven's court is final. Heaven's verdict is complete. God's judgment is infinitely perfect. And so Paul says, don't turn up at the judgment bar. Unprepared to meet your God. We then, whatever you're struggling with, don't allow the allurements of this world to have a greater pull on your life than heaven does. Don't allow anything in this life to distract you and derail you because God has a purpose for your life. There is a purpose for which to live and there are principles by which to live. The unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. And a, a healthy exercise, young people, is to find somebody to be an accountable partner, a spiritual person. Yes. To hold you accountable even while you hold yourself accountable. The unexamined life is not worth living. We can hide and do stuff. We can live anyhow. We can dress up and come to church on Sabbath morning in black suits, white shirt, black and white tie, but there's somebody who knows the real deal. We then, as workers together with you, understand this. It's more than intellect. It's more than money. It's more than human strength. It's more than masculine prowess and feminine charm. You have God's purpose to live for. And Christ came to show us how to do that. And so in preparing for the last fight, in preparing for the last battle, this war is on. He went to Gethsemane and he committed his will to the Father's will. You can't handle life successfully until your hands are in the hands of God. He went to Gethsemane. He said, Father, it's not what I want to handle the future successfully. I want your will to be my will. Oh, the psalm says, sweet will of God still fold me closer till I am wholly lost in thee, shut in with thee, my God forever. What power can thee from thee my soul can sever? When you come down to kiss a dying pillar, that's when and where the rubber meets the road. Dr. B.L. was telling you, the Anglican priest came up. I had just gotten back from downtown. I'd gone to get Carl's wrecking service to come to pull up what's left of the old car. I, I, my car had a, a pet name called Jilly. For you, it sounds like a fancy name. For my wife, it was her name for the car, Jillopy affectionately called Jilly. So I went for Carl's wrecking service to take out what's left of Jilly. 
They stood upon the embankment looking way down yonder. The mangled wreck suspended by a bamboo tuffet. The Anglican priest came up and he listened to all the first-hand eyewitness accounts. Caribbean people are fascinating people. I'm coming from church the night, three months before my wedding day. I had gotten my first pastoral district, deciding to strengthen, first of all, all of the weaker churches. And so we decided to take church outside the church because in this community, violence was spreading and folk wouldn't come inside. So we take the church. Real church does not happen while you're inside four walls. Real church takes place after you've left church. Amen. So can I ask you, when last have you done church after you've left church? Amen. So we took the church outside, built a tabernacle, prepared for the meetings for months. Finish the tabernacle on Friday evening. Went to church on Sabbath morning, armed with our handbells and, and flyers and, and, and stuff to give out. Getting ready now to go out. We've had divine service, we've had fellowship dinner. And the church is armed now to go out in the community. And just like the East wind that blew down Job's house. All of a sudden, this frantic storm sprang up out of nowhere, ripping every plant, every tree. And when it was over, we discovered the only place that the freak storm was was just around the tabernacle, ripping the tabernacle to shreds. The folk were dejected, despondent, and discouraged, downhearted. And they said, Pastor, we can't have the meetings. Tell the devil I will not die until I'm dead. I said, we're going to have it. They said, how, Pastor? It took us a long time to put it together. We can't start tomorrow. I said, we're going to start Went home the night. My fiance then had come down for us to do some planning for the wedding. She was staying by her sister. I drove up to tell her, dear, I can't meet with you today. We're going to have to talk about this stuff. And she looked at me, lost in wonder, love, and, um, and not praise, <laughs> but puzzled. Got up early morning, armed myself with machete and hammer, nail and stuff. Went up and we started working. You know, know the song? Working one to five, oh, what a way to make it. Well, I'm in church. <laughs> when evening came, folk were coming in for meetings. But I still had on my short pants. My T-shirt was a good thing that the current went, so I preached in the dark. They couldn't see what the preacher looked like. <laughs> Made an appeal in the dark, and folk came to the light of the world, who was Jesus. Amen. And so after the meeting, I met with the elders to plan our work program for Monday, those who could come. I'm on my way down now, minutes after 11, minutes to 12. The road is lonely. The streets are dark. I hear rustling crockets and lizards playing music for my listening pleasure. I'm driving down, but my eyes wouldn't cooperate with the rest of my body. Trying to keep the eyes open, but it wouldn't stay open. The next thing I know, I am tumbling. I'm tumbling, and the car is rolling, and I'm tumbling, and I don't know where I'm at. And finally, it stopped. So I rocked it to see if I was alive and the car was alive. I noticed my foot couldn't touch the ground, so I jumped down. Dazed, still, I saw a red light in there, and foolish me climbed back up inside the dangling stuff to turn off the ignition. <laughs> Turned it off. 
jumped back down, trying to figure out where was north, south, east, and west. Came up, looked around, only the sound of the river below me, whistling lizards above me. Came back the morning, a crowd was on the embankment. I stood there fascinated with the first-hand eyewitness account, telling all that happened, telling where he is, which morgue he's at, who's there with him. I'm standing there in the crowd and I'm listening to the eyewitnesses. The Anglican priest came up and he too. Now, if I wasn't there the night before, I'd be convinced the morning that he who was in the car was really dead. The Anglican priest came up, I'm standing right beside him, and he's listening, and, and, and the crowd got bigger and bigger, and I'm enjoying the reports. The Anglican priest came up, listened to the story, looked down there, and he believed not only was the man in the car dead, he believed he was stiff stone dead, dead to the third power, and you can't get any deader than that. I hope you have your own dictionary, because I have my own. And he said, may the Lord have mercy on your soul and light perpetual shine upon you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. And just then, one of my head deaconesses walked up. So I stepped back. And she's stepping forward, and I'm stepping back, because I know she's going to tell who was in the car. So she came up, and she looked. And she looked, and I'm stepping away, but I'm reading that puzzling, quizzling look in her forehead. And just when I saw the look that says, I know the car, I disappeared. And she said, I know the car. They said, who's car? Said, it's my pastor. Your pastor is. He was right here. And that, 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 that most profound and most certain and most convinced eyewitness, I took a glance at his face. Are you listening to me? Paul says, grace keeps you alive when the devil would take you out. Paul says, when you're dealing with some stuff in this life, stuff that sometimes folk have their own opinion on, but only you and God knows the real deal and the real truth. Paul says, do not receive the grace of God in vain. He has saved you for a purpose. He is keeping you for a purpose. And if he loves you enough to die for you, the least you can do is to live for him. You have God. God's purpose to live for. You have God's principle to live out. But you also have God's people to live with. I heard the preacher said, I love Christians. I just don't like church people. There's something about church people. They look in your face, smile with you, and still to lie on you. There's something about church people. I'm glad that grace is also for church people. You see, sometimes we, because of what we are not down on, we look down on them. Can, can I talk to you? We don't like homosexuals, but we love adultery and fornication. Can I talk to you? There are some stuff we don't like. Because those things don't tickle us. But grace comes for everybody. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when the thief on the cross heard him say, Father, forgive them. You and I are included in that T-H-E-M. And so the thief says, is there forgiveness for me too? Lord, remember me. And he who was dying stopped and said, today, because you ask, 
because you won't allow grace to be in vain. Today, because you recognize that grace is being dispensed right in your favor. Bob Marley says, in the abundance of water, the fool is dying for thirst. In the abundance of grace, some folk in church and out of church are head bent on their way to hell. So Paul said, I beg you, I beseech you, do not receive the grace of God in vain. So the thief said, Lord, remember me. Grace is right here beside me. And I don't want to be in the presence of amazing grace and lose my soul. And so he says, today I give you the assurance. But listen to me. He called on his father in preparation for the beginning of his final earthly battle. On the cross, he called again on his father, this time to give mercy to the undeserving, even to those who were driving nails in his hands and feet. We have God's people to live with, and sometimes the hardest in the process is to forgive those closest to you who hurt you the deepest. Sometimes the hardest, it, it's easy. David said, if it were my enemy, I could handle it. But it's my own familiar friend, the one who dips in the vessel with me. But we have God's people to live with. And the seven words on the cross says to us, we have God's purpose to live for. We have God's principles to live out. That first cry on the cross tell us that we can live with God's people if we trust ourselves in the hands of God and ask God to forgive through us. Did he not teach us to pray, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors to the extent that we forgive others? Forgive us. This is the Christian life in a summary those seven statements on the cross. And then he uttered that cry of provision, of protection. Mary, I won't leave you comfortless. John, I know you need some nurturing and I'm putting you in the hands of each other to care for each other. We sometimes, you know, read the story of, of Elijah and the widow, and we tell ourselves that, that God sent Elijah there uh, uh, for the widow to take care of Elijah. No. No. God sent Elijah there to take care of the widow. How do I know that? When Elijah met her, what did she say? She said, I only have enough left. Sometimes when grace meets us, we're down to our nothing on the borderline of suicide. Sometimes when grace finds us, we can't even be bothered with ourselves. When Elijah met her, she said, I only have enough left so that my son and I may eat and die. And he said, if you put God first, Three years of the famine left. And the Bible said, the barrel of meal never went dry. The cruise of oil never went empty. 
God did not send Elijah there for her to take care of him. God sent Elijah there for him to take care of her. Sometimes when the word of God comes, hear me carefully. When you return your faithful tithe, it's not to make God look good. You're opening the windows of heaven for your own blessing. God didn't ask us to give tithe that we may take it of him. What did he say? He said the cattle on a thousand hills belong to me. He said if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. We sometimes think that God can't do without us in our puffed up state. We feel so independent. Hear the preacher. Hear the preacher. When the gospel comes to us, when grace comes to us, it is to bring the best out of us, to bring the best to us, to take the worst from us and give us a purpose to live for and the power to live out the principles and to live with God's people and to be a wholesome entity in an unwholesome world. His next cry, I thirst, so you may understand that you are not self-sufficient, so you may understand that on the cross of Calvary was one who was all God and all man, just as he was and in his humanity. He identifies with you. And I come now in closing to our final cry, our final text, the final statement. That last statement from the cross, that final cry that comes to us in Luke 23, the last statement, the last cry. Last night, we talked about it is finished. It is finished. He wasn't finished, but he said it is finished. Your security is guaranteed. It is finished. Your inheritance is secured. It is finished. The title deed is secured. Revelation speaks about the goel. When you lose your property, in those days when you couldn't pay your debt, and you lose your sons in slavery, and then you lose your property, there comes a time when if there's somebody, someone who, 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 is, who is close to the judge and who is a part of the family, he can sign the deed he can offer up whatever is needed but he has got to be next of kin so here comes Jesus the second Adam to settle the issue where the first Adam failed to redeem every fallen descendants from Adam and now it is finished the price is paid I told you last evening that is settled. All he's doing now as he sits by his father's side is getting us ready for the inheritance. He has secured it. He's already prepared. In his father's house, a place for you. He's already prepared the banquet. All he's doing now is getting us ready to inherit the inheritance. In the beginning of the ministry, he said, Father, I surrender to you. In dealing with fulfilling the purpose, he said, Father, forgive. Now, one last cry. Luke 23 and verse 46. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit into 
thy hands. Can I play with this for the next five minutes? Into thy hands. When you have critical stuff to handle, you want safe hands to put it in. In 2008, in the economic calamity, an Italian investor right here in Manhattan, known for his skill in manipulating the stuff and the stock exchange and investing and making huge returns for people. He makes money for himself by investing other people's money. But when the bubble burst and the report was that the U.S. was facing an economic challenge as it was in 1942, he lost his money. He lost the people's money. His friend came to check on him, and in his upscale Manhattan room, they saw a note on his bed, and he's dangling from the ceiling. I've lost everything, and I can't face the future. When you have money to invest, you look for safe hands. If you're, if you're sick, and you want to entrust your care, you look for a doctor whom you think safe hands to entrust your health to. If you're courting, you look for safe hands, you look for someone who's trustworthy. You look for someone who will not trivialize love, who will not play with your heart. You look for someone in whose hands you think you are safe. Emotional security. You look for love of a genuine and lasting kind, for a long and lasting love not many people find it. You look for safe hands. You look for safe hands to invest your money in. You look for safe hands when you're courting to spend the rest of your life with. You look for safe hands with your health. When you come down to kiss a dying pillow, the only way to die right is to live right. Amen. Notice this time he says, Father, into your hands I commit my, it's a conscious decision. He's dying, but he ain't unconscious. Listen to me carefully. Hear the preacher in these closing moments, sometimes we play with the gospel under the misguided notion that we have time left to make a decision. Bear up my own brother. He was just a year and some months older. I started preaching when I was 16. Baptized at the age of 14. Didn't even know everything, but I was preaching what I know. Amen. Came out of the Methodist church and appointed myself as an apostle to the Methodist church. And in the first campaign, 19 of my Methodist friends were baptized. Didn't know everything, but I preached what I knew. My brother came. And at the appeal, he got up and he ran outside. When I got home, I said, bro, why did you leave? He said, if I had stayed, I would have surrendered. If I had stayed, but I don't think I can keep it up. I don't think I can live the Christian life. I said, listen, he who is keeping me can also keep you. He stopped his smoking. He stopped his drinking, he stopped everything else, and he would come to church now and then, but he would never get baptized. If God is not Lord of all your heart, he will not be Lord at all. Amen. I'm on my way to Boston. I'm a first year ministerial student. I'm on my way to preach at an all white congregation. Stopped in Florida to change the flight. I got a message from a friend who they knew was 
Gonna be there with me until I board the flight. Country boy traveling. Always want somebody when you have long layover period to chat with and keep your nerve together. They called him and said, find a good way to tell him his brother has been hospitalized. I rushed to the appointment and headed back home soon after I was done. Landed in Montego Bay, headed to Mandeville, and as I got to the Mandeville Public General Hospital, I don't know which room he's in, I don't know where he is, so I asked, and the nurse said, are you Glenn Samuels? I said, yes. She said, come, the doctor wants to see I said, I want to see my brother. She said, come with me, the doctor needs to see you first. I walked into his private area. He said, I know your name. I also know what you do. You're Glenn Samuels, and you're a preacher. I said, how did you know? I said, all night last night, your brother kept calling your name. All night last night, he kept saying he wants you to baptize him. His blood pressure was through the roof. Everything was going out of whack, and I'm going to tell you the straight truth, and doctors don't always do that. We thought... We were going to lose him. I tripled the medication and it sent him in reverse. I'm going to walk with you in there. He may not talk, but he may be able to hear you. I'm going to stand by your side because I know it might be difficult. I walked in there, my mother's first child, my father's first child lying on a bed with tubes in his nostrils and his mouth, needles in his hands. My mind raced back to the night he ran out of the church. His words kept echoing in my head. If I had stayed, I would have surrendered. I watched his life over the period. I watched him changing stuff. You can change some stuff, but you need God to change your heart. You need God to change your life. And sometimes grace is in vain because we do not appropriate the grace that is right in our presence. We feel we have time. We feel we can run and do some stuff and then come back to give God what's left. Church people do that too. It's not just folk outside the church. Church folks sometimes squander their opportunity, wallow their godliness in the dust of immorality, squandering their self-worth in the mire and grime of a godless society and think we have time. I'm talking to him. I don't know if he's hearing me. He never He never came out. At the graveside, I'm holding my mother, who's crying her heart out. I'm holding my sister, while one of the sisters is clutching on to my shoulder. I'm saying dust to dust, and ashes to ashes, and I have no conviction that I'll see him again. I prayed for him that morning, but he couldn't answer me. I asked him to move his eyes if he was hearing me, but he couldn't move his eyes. I asked him to nod his head just to give me some assurance. I prayed anyhow. Here is Jesus on the cross, having already surrendered his will. Now he's got the confidence that he can lay down his life in his father's hand. So he says, Father, into your hands, into your hands I commit my spirit. Mary can't help me now. John can't help me here. Into your hands. The mission is complete. My earthly mission is complete. I have done the will down here. 
Discovering God's, finding God's will for your life is your greatest discovery. Doing God's will in your life is your greatest accomplishment. I didn't come to preach a fancy gospel today. I came to beg you do not receive the grace of God in vain. The only way to die right is to live right. Can you get me an empty gown, Pastor? The only way to die right is to live right. You can't do it by yourself. That's why Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will. But live out your life within me. Oh, Jesus, King of kings, be thou thyself the answer to all my questionings. Not my will. But thine be done. I don't want to have my way. Although your way is hard to do. But I don't want to have my way. You can't go to your grave having your way. It's time to say, Lord, have your way have your way. I was listening to a song as my friend took me to church last night. I was, I was listening to the song and the song says, he is sweet I know. He is sweet I know. Storm clouds oh, may rise. Surrender but in the process in the process all to thee To discover that you have to surrender. surrender to discover that you have to surrender. To I don't know your name. I, I don't know who you are. But this gown on my right arm belongs to somebody out there. I don't know your name. I don't know who you are. But you know that God has been calling you. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Maybe you were once a baptized member of the church and the devil dragged you out. You need to surrender today. You need to come back today. Not tomorrow, not next week. You need to come back today. The only way to die right is to live a life surrendered to the will of God. I'm done. But this gown on my right arm belonged to somebody out there. Don't throw away your life. Do not waste the grace of God. I don't know where you live. I don't know your issues. But I know this. I know this one thing. God brought you here today. For a fresh start. A new beginning. A new commitment. Do you have the courage to say, God, it's my life, and I'm not going to throw it away. I have some battles, I have some struggles, I have some issues, but that gown is mine, God. Like the prodigal son, give me the best robe. Like the prodigal son, I've wandered far, but I'm coming home. I surrender. I surrender. I will not fight my conscience. I will not fight the Holy Ghost. I will not fight any longer. I surrender all. Do you have the courage to walk from down there and say, God, 
Give me the strength to make the journey. But I'm going for that gown. I'm going for that gown. I'm going to start again. I'm going. Maybe you've never been baptized. But God brought you here. Maybe you've never been a baptized member of the church. But God brought you here like the thief on the cross. This moment is yours. Will you come? Would you get up and come? I'm closing. I've got to do what God lay on my heart. I'm going to ask the congregation to stand. Everybody, would you stand? The last cry, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands. Into your hands, Father, because no other hand is good enough. Into your hands. surrendered can I have another gown there's somebody else here there's somebody else here do not waste the grace of God there's somebody else here I beseech you I beg you do not receive the grace of God in vain whatever you're dealing with his hands are the safest hands to be in whatever your struggles are his hands are the safest hands to be in. Whatever mountain you have to climb, any valley you have to cross, the hand of God are the safest hands to be in. I don't know what your struggles are, but today, today, today I beg you, do not receive the grace of God in vain. There is enough grace. There is enough grace to help you make the journey. Whatever you're struggling with, whatever you're afraid of, whatever the devil has holding you down, there's a white robe in glory that's waiting for you. Do you have strength enough to say, Jesus, today, like the thief on the cross, today, today, remember me. Remember me. I don't know your name, but God's calling your name. I don't know who you are, but this gown belongs to somebody out there. Listen to me, son. Hear me, daughter. God didn't bring me here for mere pretty talk. He brought me here to share with you those seven statements on the cross. It's time to place your life in the hand of God. It's time to place your life in the hand of God. There's nothing down here that's worth going to hell over. There's nothing down here that's worth rejecting salvation over. So Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed, Father, Father, not my will, 
Savior. Not my will. Let your will be done. He said that in preparation for the close of his earthly journey. And then on the cross before he died, before he lay his life down, he said, I'm putting it in your hands, God. I'm putting it in your hand. There's somebody here today. I don't want to hold up the service much longer. But grace says, preacher, call some more. There's somebody here struggling. There's somebody here. It's a fight to the finish. Would you surrender? Would you surrender? This gown is yours. This gown on my hand belong to somebody else here. I want you in the name of Jesus Christ to walk out and come. Our heads are bowed. To thee, my blessed Savior. Our heads are bowed. I surrender. She whispered to me that they murdered her mother. When you're dealing with grief and challenging illness, the best hands to put your life in is the hand of God. When you're dealing with inexplicable tragedies, when you're dealing with unsought for and unwelcome issues, the best hands to put the problems in, the hands of God. The best hands to put your future in, the hands of God. The best hands when, when darkness seems to veil his face, when the trials are mounting, the best hands, the safest hands are the hands of God. Before this baptism is over, somebody sitting, standing down there in the hearing of my voice, hearing the organ plays, I surrender. You need to take this gown and say, God, I'm not going back home the way I came here. I'm not going back home without putting it all in your hands. So when you think I'm going under, part the waters, Lord. When you see the waves around me, calm the sea. Because I'm giving them all. I'm giving them all to Jesus. Let us pray. Our heads are bowed. And I'm about to pray. But I have a word for a young man here. I don't know who you are. One year after I was baptized... I almost left the church. One year after I was baptized, I broke my left arm. I could have gone to church with a broken hand, but I stayed home. No Adventist family, no Adventist friend. Stayed home. Had my own song service. Had my own Sabbath school. Had my own 10 minutes, my own divine service my own Bible class. And by afternoon, the devil said, aren't you tired of having church all by yourself? And I heard down the road the sound of the guys I used to run with. So I walked out the house. My folk are not Adventists, so they didn't care. I walked out the house, walked on the road, Walked on the lane and joined the guys, playing games and doing stuff. I lost the fragrance of the morning worship I had by myself. And just then I looked at the road and I saw that church folk were coming home. And I got vexed first. They didn't see me, but I got vexed. You ever hit a frog with a stone and see the frog puffed up? Well, I was puffed up like a frog. Can I be plain Caribbean? 
let them come talk to me. Let them come talk to me. I'm going to tell them something, you see. Let them come talk to me. They're going to tell me now that me let, 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 let them come talk to me. They looked down the lane and they saw me. Three of them came down the lane and their first word made all the difference. They came down the lane and they stood there for a moment in silence and then they said, we missed you in church today. We missed you and we were on our way to your house because we love you. We missed you. And when you are finished with these guys, we'll just stand here and wait. We'll just stand here and wait. And when you're finished, would you come home with us to your house? I got done right away dusted my hands and I walked home they told me who preached they told me who prayed they told me who did all the stuff and after they prayed with me and we had fellowship and they were about to leave night had fallen they conked me in my head and said what were you doing down there had they done that first I wouldn't be here today. It's a revival. I want to say to senior church folk, look around you for struggling people. Be kind even in your criticism. Amen. Be kind when you find folk drifting. Because you may be the difference between drifting further or coming back. Look around you and know that you have God's purpose to live for. And maybe God's purpose in that moment is to bring back a struggling soul. I want to pray with you and for you. You're not content in just living an ordinary life. You're saying, God, Calvary means total sacrifice. Calvary means total sacrifice. Someone said the chicken and the pig met together to decide what to serve the master for breakfast. The pig said to the chicken, let's serve the master eggs. The chicken said, no, let's serve the master eggs and bacon. The pig said to the chicken, for you, that's only a small contribution. But for me, it is total sacrifice. God is not looking for a small contribution. Calvary demands total sacrifice. When he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It was total surrender. I don't want to live an ordinary Christian life. Knelt down by my bed last night. I said, God, it's time for you to do in and through the church what you did on the day of Pentecost. I don't want to be just an ordinary Christian. Calvary demands total sacrifice. I'm going to ask him to sing that verse and chorus one last time. And if you, by the grace of God, at the end of this revival, if you want to sign a spiritual contract with God Almighty, saying, God, if you will be with me, I'm done with mediocre Christianity. I'm done with dwarfed visions and small goals. I'm done, God, I'm done with that. I want for the rest of my life to be the best of my life. I want the rest of my life to be the best of my life. As he sings, I surrender. Oh, if that's you, you're in the church. Jesus, Officer or not. I surrender. Come on quickly. Closing in two short minutes. Oh, Total sacrifice. Full surrender. Renewed commitment. Give. 
Calvary demands that. You're coming, saying, God, you did it through Peter and John. I'm surrendering myself. Total sacrifice. Full surrender. Pour on me and in me. The latter rain. The Holy Ghost power. So I can fully be what you want me to be. Come on quickly if that's you. It's time to pray. Walk out of that row and come. God knows your uprising and downsetting. He knows your ins and out. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Walk out of the row. Say, God, I'm done with anything less than full surrender. I'm d I I've been trying all my life, God, for full surrender. But every time I try, the devil pulled me back. I'm coming one more time. Father, into your hands. Into your hands. Into your hands, Father. I command the rest of my life. I commit the rest of my days. I commit my intellect. I commit my talents. I commit my body. I commit my all into your hands. Into your hands. When I come down to kiss a dying pillow, into your hands. When I'm facing the challenges, into your hands. When I'm facing decisions I can't think through, into your hands. Into your hands. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. Into your hands. I surrender. I surrender. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. Blessed Savior. I surrender. I'm going to ask my pastor, your pastor, to pray this prayer of commitment and recommitment as we place it in the hands of God. We go to high school graduation and university services, and we hear them sing the song. In your hands, in your hands, I commit my joys and sorrows. I place all my future in your hands. Here we stand. We have not yet graduated from this life. The future beckons. The seven words on the cross speaks to us. The last word is a challenge to us. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. God, into your hands we place our lives done with low living, done with procrastination, done with worldly desires. We place our lives in your hand. Oh God, we have been battered, terrorized, tormented, but we are glad to know that there is security in your hands. Yes. We come today reflecting on Calvary. We see you nudely hanging in that middle cross. And we thank you that you paid a debt that we couldn't pay. Lord, we recognize we are still debtors and we need to surrender all. In your hands, we place our todays because we know you will take care of us for our tomorrows. We ask you to forgive us of our yesterday so we can have full assurance 
of life everlasting that you have promised. God, thank you that you embraced us. We come to the altar today. We ask you to just take us as we are. We want to sign a contract with heaven today that the world behind us, the cross before us, no turning back. Praise the Lord. No turning back. You drank the hyssop and we beg you for a purging. Oh God, die out in us no matter what. If only sin die out in us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please go back to your seat and fin let's finish the service with victory. Blessed Savior, I surrender all. And the people of God say, Amen. I even feel like saying hallelujah. Hallelujah, thine, thine the glory. Hallelujah, O oh Lord, hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. That blood will never lose its power. When we came here this morning, we didn't know what was going to be God's agenda for today. But he came through for us. When we came here this morning, the preacher was delayed because of circumstances, but he was determined to be here to present the word. The devil must be ashamed. God must be glorified. Thank God. We have this morning four men. And we have perhaps one lady. And perhaps there just might be perhaps a fighting soul in the audience today who can be assured that beat by water by fire he can make you whole and as a spirit speaks to you with your whole heart won't you say my answer will be yes Lord Yes. So, Albert Lee is saying yes Amen. to Jesus. Amen. Louis Esquire is saying yes to Jesus. Louis. Louis Enriquez, <laughs> mi amigo. Si. Carville Blett is saying yes to Jesus. Yeah. And Orain Evans is saying yes to Jesus. Yeah. Turn around and let them see you. And we're going to start the service with them. And if there's somebody else who wants to say yes, God will never say no. 
Praise God. Praise God. Now I have a question or two for you, man. Your wedded day. Do you believe and appreciate? Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? And do you so desire to live with him according to his will? When you make a covenant today at the altar, that whatever he says you will do, where he sends you will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Do you believe in the, the Bible church of prophecy? That God's last day church is preparing a people for the coming of the Lord. Would you like to desire membership in God's invisible kingdom? And while preparing for his coming, be a member of his remnant church on earth with local membership here at the Grand Concourse. Yes. By the grace of God, I charge you to put your hands in the hands of the man who still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Ask the Savior to help you comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He's willing to aid you, and he will carry you through. So, dear Lord, bless Lorraine, Albert, Louis, and Carville that as they walk with you, they will stay in your hands. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Trevor, put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water. We're going to sing that. The deacon will take you to your final burial place. And I'm so delighted that Pastor Case He's going to have his first baptism at the concourse. And he'll remember that. Easter Sabbath, 2019. Put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water. There's still a guy on here. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, then you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Gallery. Oh, put your hand in the hand of the man who still the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calm the sea. Take a look at yourself, then you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. In the hand of the man who still the water. Put your hands. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, then you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. If there are any family members here for Brother Orville Billet, would you please stand? Hi. You're here, his daughter and grandson. Granddaughter. Granddaughter are here. And my dear Brother Billet, because of your love for the Lord and your desire to walk with the Lord and the light of his word, as your servants, we now baptize you in the baptism of Jesus on the authority of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the church say, Amen. Amen. Now we bury him in baptism so he can rise to walk in newness of life. crimson wave, the deep 
open wide. Jesus, my Lord, mighty to save, point to the wondrous side. Sing! The, the cleansing stream, I see, I see, I, I plunge the Lord, he cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, he cleanseth me, he cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. At me. Now listen to me. Listen to me. This was a song they sang at my baptism, July 6, so many years ago. I'd like you to sing it with verve. Sing it with life. So Trevor, just lay away that dull slope they have and let's lead us in it. Let's go. Oh, now I see the crimson rise, I hear the deep and wide. Jesus, the mighty little point, point to the wondrous side. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge the Lord, he cleanseth me, he turn the Lord, he cleanseth me, he cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I see the new creation rise. I hear the sweet and blood, the spark of blood beneath the sky. Drinking, drinking flood, the cleansing stream. I see, I see. I plunge the Lord, He cleanseth me. Praise the Lord, he cleanseth me, he cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. I met last evening as I was going outside, I, meet, I met these two ladies, and in talking to them, we developed kindred ties because we are from the same section of St. Elizabeth, Pastor Samuels. They are from Hilltop. So as I probed them, I found out that she's married to my cousin. My real cousin. Yes, Amaziah Foster, my real cousin. Aunt Herman's son. Yeah. And then I found out that this was his wife. So welcome to the family. And I'm going to give you all rights and privileges, not only into my blood family, but in my spiritual family. Amen. And your husband leads the way today. He's now going to become the real leader of the home. And what a joy it is going to be to see both of you worshiping together. The worst it can do for you is what it has done for me. We give God thanks. So now, cousin, <laughs> because of your love for the Lord and your desire not to spurn the pleadings of the cross, we now baptize you in the baptism of Jesus on the authority of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Say amen. amen. And now we bury you in baptism. So I rise, rise to walk walk in heaven, no night of life. above the world unseen, with heart made pure and garments white, and Christ enthroned within. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge the Lord, he cleanseth me, oh, praise the Lord. He cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Amazing grace is heaven below. Oh, feel the blood applied. 
died and Jesus only Jesus now my Lord is crucified oh, a cleansing Lord. stream I see I see, I see. Oh, I plunge the Lord he cleanseth me oh praise the Lord he cleanseth me he cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Are there any family members for Albert in the house tonight, today? No? But he, all of us are now family. Though none go with me, yet still I'll follow. No turning back, praise the Lord. No turning back. So my dear brother Lee, upon the profession of your faith and your love for the Lord, we now baptize you in the baptism of Jesus on the authority of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we say, Amen. And now bury you in baptism so that you, from this day forward, can rise to walk in the newness of life. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning, no back. turning back. Praise the Lord. No turning back. The world behind me. The world behind me the cross before me the world behind the me. world behind me the cross before me the world behind me the cross before me no turning back no turning back praise the lord no turning back mi amigo Amigo, Louis Henriquez. Congratulations. We're so happy for him. I saw him walk into this church with a pep in his step this week. Last night he came up here and he participated in the program and we asked him to do an opening hymn and he came up and he said, I want you to sing the opening song, but I also want you to know tomorrow I will be baptized. Yeah. Thank God for determined men. Amen. The country take on men and send them to war and kill them off. But we are happy for men who will be in the service of the king. Amen. And so, mi amigo, upon the profession of your faith, we now baptize you in the baptism of Jesus on the authority of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And now bear you in baptism. No longer with so me, yet still I follow. Though none go with me, yet still I follow. Though long go with me, yet still I follow. No turning back, praise the Lord, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, praise the Lord, no turning back. Can you, can you wait a minute for somebody else? So sing a song. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, praise the Lord, no turning back. No ones go with me, yet still I follow. No longer with me, yet still I follow. No longer with me, yet still 
will I follow. No turning back. Praise the Lord. Turning Take me to the water. And I'll let you know that we have a wardrobe upstairs. If somebody else is here and the Spirit of the Lord tells you right now, here's water, what doth hinder you? There's a wardrobe upstairs. Let's sing. Take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. Keep the Sabbath holy. Keep the Sabbath holy. Keep the Sabbath holy and be baptized. Oh, take me to the water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. Oh, Jesus, I will follow Jesus. I will follow Jesus and be baptized. Oh, take me to water. Take me to the water. Take me to the water to be baptized. There is a fountain by the plunge beneath the flood lose all the guilty stain the dying thief rejoice to see the fountain in his day and there may I though Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins. And there may I, though vile I be, wash all my sins away. Thou dying lamb, thy precious blood shall ever lose its power. Until all the ransom church are there to sin no more. Ask the congregation to stand. Are safe to sin no more. Are safe to sin no more. Are safe. Are safe. 
to sin no more. Sister Henry isn't here today, and a number of our women have retreated. They're retreating. But we're so happy that Sister Lightbody stood in the gap for us this week and helped us in the preparation of these people. We have in the water for the last candidate today somebody who dearly needs your prayer, Sister Amen. Odette Chisa. Her aunt is here. And these are Clarence family. Amen. So good to come to the house and be treated royally by them. And now we are in the same house, the same family, the family of God. Odette will be praying for you. The best place to be is in the hands of God. Amen. And you are there. And upon the profession of your faith, your love for the Lord, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, the name of the blessed Holy Ghost. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. And now we bury you in baptism so you can rise to walk in the newness of life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And I want you to spend a silent moment giving God thanks for Calvary. Giving God thanks for today. And giving God thanks for victories won. I need silence everywhere. Even from Brother Jackson. A moment of silence. When every other voice is hushed. And in penitence we wait before him. The silence of the soul. Makes more distinct. The voice of God. I'm wondering, in the silence of this moment, if somebody's here that wants to say, Pastor, in the very soon, near future, very soon, I would like to surrender myself to the hand of God. And while the heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and each person is minding his or her own salvation, I wonder if somebody's in the congregation, I'm not going to call you to come forward. A preacher has done that already. But if you are there and you want to raise your hand and say, Pray for me, 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 pray for me. Would you want to raise your hand out there? God bless those hands. I see them. When is there anybody in this congregation today that has a burden on your heart for somebody you would love to see come into the hand of Jesus? Would you want to raise your hand and stand in the gap for that one? You know God knows the person for whom you raise your hands right now. So we close this part of the service, Lord. Ask you to look on us. Hear the cry our little heart makes today. Break down every 
barrier. Cast out every foe. Wash us. Or make us whiter than snow. Is the prayer we leave with today. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen.